Today what I'm going to try to do is open one of your circuits. I'm going to show you how to play with it. I'll show you how to practice with it. It's all about your belief systems. How many people believe in extrasensory perception? Well, now we got something to go for here, but <laughs> when seals would do it, maybe two out of seven. That's why the first seal unit was only eight units, only eight of us. The new seal units are all bigger. There was eight of us, and we were little monsters. <laughs> no, no, I got some stories. <laughs> um, I've got, you know, memories. <laughs> you know, there's no bone. And, uh, you know, we've been places, saw things, and now... Uh, know how to see the fruit in the trees. Look at that red over there in those trees. Teaching you how to see things far away and right here in front of you. Because guess what? Space and time are not real. And that means it's not really extrasensory perception. Dr. Rind in the 30s broke the phenomena into two categories. There was extrasensory perception and PK phenomena. Now, PK phenomena was outside the body, and ESP was inside the body. And while I have delved in this area with remote viewing and things of that nature, that's dangerous. You know, as I'm doing my little Tai Chi, and I'm a monkey warts on the, on the, on the, on the limb. <laughs> you know? uh, this part was broken into five categories. And we're going to talk about each one. It's broken in five categories. I'm going to name them, and then I'm going to talk about each one. There's clairvoyance, telepathy, precognition, precognition, I went through a senior ADD moment there. <laughs> Astral projection and radiesthesia. You know, like uh, Hieronymus. And all the Japanese lanterns above you fell down in a nice little pod thing. Um, with that, see, nobody ever noticed that Japanese lantern right behind you there. Whoops, there it is. And so, with that said, clairvoyance, all extrasensory information is brought into consciousness your this this place right here that I am not over here or there this place via a hallucination of some form you either hear it clairaudience you feel it clairsentient or clairvoyance you see it you know you're seeing clairvoyance clairaudience clairsentient it's important concept there means that what you're actually experiencing isn't really real. There's a grain of information that has to go through some sort of weird filter process so you can get it. But the fact is, you have it all. And what you need to do is focus on individual spots. So my first book, the ESP book, talks at the eighth chapter, talks about the different depths of hypnosis. Hypnosis is you listening to my voice, sleep now, ha ha ha, but excluding the river. And that, everybody has a little different on that. And that is called the depth of hypnosis. And what we wanted was a way to measure the depth of hypnosis. How deep is he? How up is he? And so in the eighth chapter, what I've done is I've broken it down into categories like this is where your nose goes numb. <laughs> this is where, huh? The, you know, different stages that I could measure from a physical plane point of view and say, oh, he's in stage seven, <laughs> you know, as opposed to 12. Clairvoyance, clairvoyance, clairsentient. Telepathy. Now... The experiments that I did with Edgar Mitchell, there were a bunch of them we did, and how we did them <laughs> was that they didn't know they were going to do these tests until he was already moving toward the moon, and he said, I won't do anything more unless we do these tests. They brought me in. <laughs> That's how we did it. He blackmailed uh, to, to get these tests done because this was the first time in history we had an ability to put 
space between us, distances so we could measure time, you know, how long it took. This was the first time we had an option to put big things in front of us, blocking it like, like, like the moon. We, you know, it was a, an opportunity to do some serious testing that we couldn't do on Earth. What we were able to discover is, I didn't know what to call it, so I decided to call it PSI energy, psi energy. What happened was, when Hertak and Mitchell were working together, I was running the whole thing at, at Canaveral, and uh, I was Navy Intel at the time, and uh, I had a couple of my brethren, a military, and we did this ex series of experiments, and what we discovered, psi energy, apparently, and we could reproduce that, was independent of space and time. That means that we were dealing on something more fundamental than space, uh, space time. We were dealing with a subset that was more real than our illusion of space time. Your, spa your concept of time, for example, is Robert Ornstein says it is a duration of consciousness. It is the way you wrap proteins and the fact that you have two brains. And you have a little bottleneck down there. And so to move it around in a holographic system takes time. Or the illusion of it going from one place to the other with little signals going and moving the memory and the wrapped of proteins and so on. Microtubule. It's all in metaphor. I can, I can give you a bunch of examples of uh, where time is an illusion. But I did that a long time ago in Chicago. Uh, and that paper was called Time Distortion, or I never knew there were corners in time until I was told to stand in one. And it's important to concept, because in the boxing world, one of the things I taught uh, my SEALs was not Tai Chi, but how when they were boxing and you were, you were coming in to box, where if when someone would throw a blow at you, you could come back and have the perfectness of the roundness to come in and, and do him. And, uh, you know, where you're going to hit him hard. And um, you can do that, and that's, I think, power tool number five, <laughs> where you use breathing to change your perception of time where you're almost hallucinating, you're like, you're, you're hallucinating, but you're able to do it so that you're able to uh, have that movement, precision. And that's the difference between being world-class and normal.